Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying our little journey so far today. Let me take you into God's Word and uh, share a few minutes with you there. All right? Why don't you take a Bible out if you've got one handy and find Mark's Gospel, Chapter 4, and we'll start there in a minute or two. But let me just introduce it this way. Victor Hugo, at 90, who was the famous most famous for his novel, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, also wrote a story called 93. It talks about a ship caught in a dangerous storm on the high seas. At the height of the storm, the frightened sailors hear a crashing noise below decks. And they knew the noise came from a cannon, part of the ship's cargo that had broken loose and was moving back and forth with the swaying of the ship in the storm, crashing into the sides of the hold, threatening to break through. It was a monstrous thing. Knowing that it could cause the ship to sink, two brave sailors volunteered to make the dangerous attempt to retie the loose cannon. Why? Because they knew the danger of a shipwreck from the cannon was greater than the danger from the fury of the storm. And that's where we are today. We're in a storm. And that's human life. Storms may blow about us, but it's often not these exterior storms that pose the gravest danger. It's the unresolved patterns of sin, guilt, and unforgiveness that can exist within us that often overwhelm us and cause more problems than what's going on on the outside. The furious storm outside may be overwhelming, but it's what's going on on the inside that can throw, pose a, a greater threat to our well-being. And our only hope then lies in the power of the Holy Spirit modeled for us by Jesus. Because unfortunately, worry, fear, comfort, uh, uh, worry, fear, anxiety, self-doubt, those patterns that rage within us cannot be transformed by ourselves alone. If you could have done it yourself, you'd have done it already, but you haven't been able to. So this morning, I'm going to urge you to turn to Jesus And call on the Holy Spirit for help so that things can be changed in your circumstances. You see, the Holy Spirit is our only hope of stilling the tempest that can further impair our souls and cripple our lives. He can give us confidence in the midst of the storm. So let's pray. And then talk this morning for a few minutes about surviving the storm. Surviving the storm. Let's pray together. Father, Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand what it is you're trying to say. In the name of Christ, amen. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4 and verse 1. Here's what it says. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. And he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. And he taught them by telling them many stories in the form of parables. He told them that the kingdom was like a farmer who went out to sow seeds. He compared the kingdom to a small mustard seed that becomes a giant plant. And he told stories all day long. The daylight hours quickly slipped past. So let's pick up the story again at verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. The sun was setting, and they were on their way across the lake. It had been a busy day. But as dusk faded, trouble loomed on the horizon. The Sea of Galilee was notorious for sudden violent storms, and that night was one of them. Mark chapter 4 and verse 37. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and began to fill it with water. You know, here's what I know. Storms can come on awfully fast. Storms come suddenly, just like they do in life. Everything's going beautifully. 
everybody's congratulating you, things are going your way, and all of a sudden the phone rings, you get a text, and all of a sudden your life is upside down. And that's how this pandemic came for many of us. It came rather suddenly. I mean, we were watching it on the news back in January, watching what was happening in China, shaking our heads. And uh, we were sad that it was so bad. And we said a prayer, I hope, for the uh, global workers that were over there and the people that were suffering. And uh, basically shut ourselves off and said, well, that's too bad, so sad. And uh, let it go with that. Now, three months later, we're in the midst of the storm. You know, friends, it doesn't take long for a storm to come. And there are some people today who are listening to me in whose life a storm is raging far beyond COVID-19. That's the storm on the outside. But I'm talking about the storm on the inside. The pandemic has just added another layer of complexity to your life. For some of you, it's added financial stress. For others, uh, another layer of complexity to your health issues. Others are being swamped in your relationships because March break off for the kids, that was one week and that was, that, that was good. When it got to the second week, that was troubling. The third week, oh man, oh man, that was, that was heavy. And now we're starting to get into relational difficulties. Some of you are having to work through all of this, your essential services. And I mean, you love your job, normally. I mean, God gave you that job and you were pretty happy with it. (laughs) But things are getting challenging and you're getting frustrated with the boss because there's not enough wipes and enough time to wash up and get clean. The clients are troublesome and the customers are irritable. And the pandemic storm is building on the outside, but the pressure is also building in you on the inside. And some of you today are feeling the water start to wash into the boat, just like the disciples were experiencing in the storm. Water's already sloshing around inside your boat. You're starting to feel like you're sinking financially, relationally, spiritually. And, And you do the same thing that I do and that the disciples did. You start looking for that Jesus character who got you here because they got into this in obedience. You know that, right? Jesus said to them, didn't he? Let's go over to the other side. So now the storm is raging and where is Jesus? Well, <laughs> the Bible says in Mark 4:38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Jesus was asleep. It doesn't appear he even knows the storm is raging. He can't seem to hear the howl of the wind, the rain pounding down on his face, the waves crashing over the side of the boat, the tempest is raging, and Jesus is sleeping. (laughs) Have you ever wondered about that? Wondered if in the last few weeks Jesus has somehow gone to sleep in the boat? Doesn't he care about what's going on on my job, at the house, with my spouse? What does all this mean? Well, let me quickly tell you four things it doesn't mean. The first thing it doesn't mean is that God doesn't love you. God loves you, friends. You can rest secure in that. The second thing it doesn't mean is that God's mad at you. The third thing is that God is not paying you back for something you did. You didn't cause it. Fourth thing to know is that God is not toying with you. Now, the sudden furious storm may be overwhelming, but what's going on inside can pose a greater threat to our lives. You see, here's the problem with the storm. The storm strips away the superficial veneer, my uh, cultured humanity. It strips away some of the facade of my spirituality, the stuff that's not real, you know, if you don't. You know, fake it till you make it. It's not going to work now. The storm takes all that stuff away. And that's what I learned in the storm, is that storms not only come up suddenly, storms reveal us to ourselves. They show us who we are. They hold up a mirror. And unfortunately, they don't just hold up a mirror for us. They hold up a mirror for others too. You see, storms don't make or break us. They just reveal us. It may be obvious to some of you, 
But let me say it again, storms take our spiritual temperature. They help us assess our status. It certainly did it for the disciples. <laughs> they, they, Peter's at the front of the boat, the storm is raging, and all of a sudden somebody's running to the back of the boat, and Jesus is sleeping, and the disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care? Don't you care that we're going to drown? Now, you know and I know that some of these disciples, about four out of the twelve are experienced fishermen. I mean, they've been on Galilee before. They've likely been through the odd storm. So why all the fear? Well, I don't know. But here's what I know. They were in the storm, and the storm <laughs> certainly <laughs> revealed who they were. Those were their real feelings. They were frightened, and they couldn't understand why this was happening or how this was happening. But one thing they did know for sure, they needed all hands on deck, and they ran for Jesus. Some people think the storms only come to your life when you've disobeyed God, but that's not always the case. Jonah ended up in a storm because of his disobedience. But these disciples, friends, remember, they're in this storm because Jesus said, let's get in the boat and go. And they got in the boat and went with Jesus. They're in this storm in obedience. So why do storms come then? Let me give you three thoughts. Three thoughts. First one. Sometimes storms are consequences of our own choices. That's the Jonah thing. You've done something wrong and it bounces back at you. Sometimes the storm, secondly, is a test. Let's talk about that for a second. A test indicates this. A test indicates you have the information, the resources, and the ability to deal with the situation at hand. The test just says you've got all that you need. You can get through this. So let's see how you do. In fact, 1 Peter says in chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through, as if some strange thing were happening. Instead, be glad, because these trials will make you partners with Christ in his suffering, and afterward you will have the wonderful joy of sharing in his glory when it's displayed to the world. I hope that's where you're going, to the glory displayed to the world. What's the third reason? The third reason is that we live in a follow, fallen world, and sometimes, friends, Stuff happens. Storms just happen. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11 lays it out again. I saw that, uh, saw that under the sun the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor the riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. In other words, good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. So what's the deal, Pastor? Well, the deal is you have to be prepared. Are you prepared? There was a TV camera crew down in Florida after Hurricane Andrew. And the camera panned the area where the devastation and debris was. And there were houses down and turned over automobiles the whole nine yards. Amazingly, in that neighborhood, there was one lone house standing on its foundation. And the owner was cleaning up his yard. And the reporter came up to him and said, Sir, why is your house the only one standing? The guy straightened up, pushed out his chest, and said, I built it myself. I built it myself, and I built it according to the Florida State Building Code. So when the code said two by six roof trusses, I used two by six roof trusses. When it said hurricane brackets, I put on hurricane bracket. In fact, the code assured me that if I built this house according to it, it would withstand the hurricane. And I built it that way, and it withstood the hurricane. He looked around and said, I guess nobody else followed the code. This was a man who understood something. He knew that storms were coming and they had nothing to do with him. It was just about the area in which he lived and the nature of the storms that were coming to that area. And the only thing he could do was be prepared. Were you prepared? I don't mean did you have enough toilet paper. I mean, were you ready? Were you focused? Were you in the right place with Jesus? when the storm broke because that's all you could be was prepared 
you couldn't account for all of the variables. The important thing, then, is not to understand why storms come, but to be prepared. You know, I used to read the story and think the disciples woke Jesus up to calm the storm. But I read that story through in all the gospel accounts and realized they had no idea he could do that yet. I, I, I think personally they woke him up because the water was sloshing in the bottom of the boat and they were going down and they wanted help. And they said, Jesus, get up, grab a pail and bail. <laughs> Jesus, help. And, un, and unusually, well, not unusually, I guess, Jesus was thinking in a totally different direction. And so the unexpected happens. The Bible says Jesus gets up, but he doesn't pick up a bucket or grab an oar in the nearly swamped boat. Instead, he does what only the Son of God can do, and he changes the situation entirely. Here's what the Bible says. He got up, he rebuked the wind and the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it got completely calm. And a few verses later, we read that the disciples were completely terrified. I mean, they had been scared of the storm. But this was scarier yet. Well, I can relate to those disciples. How about you? Like them, I've been in storms. I've been desperate for help. Like them, I turned inward and began to call in favors. I did everything I knew to extricate myself from my troubles when I couldn't bail anymore. My resources seemed to be too small and my abilities didn't seem to stretch far enough. I turned around and said to Jesus, Don't you care? foolish man and yet in mercy i have to tell you he responded to me but not at all the way i expected i i thought he was going to step in with a few pointers on how to keep my boat afloat in a storm <laughs> instead he challenged me and then changed the way i saw him altogether and he changed the way i see the world i i i, I i'm with the amazing grace i once was blind but now i see I don't see everything yet, nor do I expect to. It was an act of mercy on his part, but let me tell you the internal transformation that came about in that process was life-changing. It wasn't just behavioral modification. It was transformation. You see, unfortunately, the storms of doubt, the anxiety and the fear that rage within us Exposed in crisis can't be fully corrected by us alone. It takes the transforming power of the Spirit as revealed by Jesus. He's our only hope of stilling the tempest, transforming the character flaws, finding the insight, the direction, the timing, the patience to move forward. You see, he can root out the doubt and the anxiety and the fear that will harm our souls and cripple our lives in the midst of the crisis so that the boat doesn't sink from the inside out. I noticed that when he dealt with the disciples after all this, he didn't deal with them with condemnation, but with a gentle word of rebuke, he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Hmm. Perhaps this is why some boats go down. When we find ourselves in the midst of the storm, we try to handle it. We just have to push through or move on or find the right people to help us out. What we really need is to hear a word from God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need a spirit-inspired word from the Lord to focus or refocus our faith in the midst of the situation with our family so that we can be transformed, like Paul said, by the renewing of our minds. Because then we'll be able to see the way forward. We can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's not about the storm or the spouse or the kids or the job. It's, it's about spiritual renewal. It's about transformation and change. I don't believe that that day Jesus rebuked his disciples for their lack of ability to see that he could calm the storm. I believe Jesus was disappointed that they hadn't grasped who he was and they hadn't heard what he said. Oh, oh, they heard him. They heard him enough to get on track. They just couldn't stay there. What about you? 
Well, what do you mean? Well, let's go back again to chapter 4, verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Jesus, the Son of God, spoke this word to his disciples. What did he say? Let us go over to the other side. All of us are going to the other side. You see, he told them about the end at the beginning. Now, he didn't tell them what was between the end and the beginning. They'd have never gotten in that boat in the first place. and You and I wouldn't have either. But when he says, let us go over to the other side, we're going to the other side. That's just like Jesus. When the furious squall came up and the waves were breaking over the boat so that it was nearly swamped, where was Jesus? He was sleeping. Why? Because they were going over to the other side. Together. All of them. He told them the end. At the beginning. So when you find yourself and your family on the sea of life in the midst of a storm, and we're in one now, and the boat is starting to take on water, may I suggest of you that you turn around and see if Jesus is in the boat? I mean, friends, if, if he's guided and directed you and you're walking in obedience to his call and commission, fulfilling his plans and his purposes for you, and the pandemic has come, you're right in the center of where you're supposed to be. Where else would you want to be? And that brings me to my final point, which is really simple. you got to ask yourself in the storm, is Jesus in the boat? Now, I hope you figured that out before this started. Because Jesus promised those who were his disciples that if they would go where he sent them in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, if they would go where he sent them, he would always be with them. So this is a storm, friends. Forget the spiritual facade and the high, pious words. Is he in the boat or are you there by yourself? And if he's there, what's he doing? Is he sleeping? Is he smiling? Now, now you don't have to be rude to him. But it's all right to call on him. He's one of your resources, you know, if this is a test. Just call on his name. Ask for help. Just remember, with the disciples, <laughs> he may not do what you expect. But let me say this. You don't need to panic. The situation may appear bleak or uncertain. You don't need to be fearful or immobilized. Talk to Jesus. Let him use the storm to transform your life and your circumstances because he's made promises. Let me give you one of them. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. Watch this now. You're going to want to read this again. Keep your life free from the love of money. We could stop there, but let's not. And be content with what you have. Well, that's room for pause. But let's move on. For he has said, based on those other two things, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? He has promised that he will not leave you or forsake you. So you can confidently say, if he's in the boat, that you don't have to fear. He is your helper. We'll get through this together. Does that mean that the clouds dissipate immediately? Not always. Will I no longer have to struggle with problems? He never promised that. In fact, he promised me in the world we would have tribulation. Okay, well, well, well then, does, does he promise me at least that I'll materially prosper after this and, 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 and have perfect health? Probably not. Well, that, that doesn't sound like the promise you're giving me is all that great. Listen to me. Listen to the word of God better than listening to me any day of the week. Noah got his family through the storm by faith and obedience. Moses got Israel out of Egypt through faith and obedience. After they messed up in the desert, after 40 years, when Israel started to move by faith and obedience, they got over into the promised land. 
Mary, by faith and with obedience, came through her pregnancy and went into history. And faith in God and obedience to his word will be sufficient to get you and your family through this storm as you walk by faith in obedience. Now let me give you two quick things before we pray and wrap this up this morning. Let me remind you of two things, can I? First thing, let me remind you that I'm praying for you. You're not alone in this. I'm praying for you. I know there's other people praying for you. You've got probably got some phone calls this week from a few of them. Third John chapter 1, verse 2 is what I'm praying for you, dear friends. We're praying that all will be well with you and that your body will be as healthy as we know your soul is. So I'm praying for you. Second, let me remind you of a verse that you know really well. Given, it shall be given to you. Good measure and pressed down and shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. It's not hoard and you will have. Think of the toilet paper people. It's give, and it shall be given. Some of you are wondering <laughs> about finances, and you're saying, well, how do I do that? You're not going to pass the plate. Well, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can go to the website, fgcniagara.com, click on giving, and put your money in through PayPal. Send Paul or Marlene an email and let them know how you would like that money dispersed missions wherever. Or you can send them an e-transfer, fullgospel.church1 at gmail.com. And again, send along an email with a password and uh, let them know how you would like that dispersed. I've had a few folks drop by. I've been in and out of the church this week and they've caught me here and they've left the offering here. If you're out and about and that's what you intend to do, please give me a call or give the church a call. And if I'm here, I'd be glad to meet you and we'll make sure that Paul gets a hold of of your offering. <laughs> I'm waiting. I got to tell you, I'm getting anxious for the day already when we can get together and celebrate God's faithfulness in one room and not with just FaceTime and Zoom. But let me end this time by praying with you again today. We don't know what's ahead of us, but we're not frightened because we know that God's in the boat with us. You know that, right? And I trust you've made sure he's in the boat because this is a storm. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every person watching this event today, wherever they are, I ask that you give them a spirit of calm, the peace that passes understanding. As we experience your presence in daily devotion, prayer times, may we be witnesses to one another in our family and our world of the peace, the calm, the joy, the confidence, the faith that comes from knowing you. We know the darker the night gets, the brighter the light shine. You said, let your light so shine before men. So let our light shine before others that they see our good works, the words and the works of a transformed mind. Oh, God, transform us today so that they can turn and glorify you because of what you're doing and have done in us. Use this pandemic to transform us for your glory and the growth of your kingdom. We pray for those that are sick today. You're the great physician. We pray for mild symptoms and quick recoveries. For those, Lord, who don't know they've got it, we pray that they'll discover it quickly so that they can get help and shield others. Lord, we turn to you again in our hearts and minds. We repent and, ask and thank you in the midst of this contagion that we can experience your forgiveness and your grace to empower us to get through this as we depend on you and on one another. Inspire us again to love each other. Energize us to serve and help each other. May we lead this culture by example. With your head bowed, if you don't know that Jesus is in the boat this morning and you want him in the boat, I'm going to invite you to pray a brief prayer with me with sincerity from your heart. And if you do that, if you turn around, you'll find that he's in the boat. Pray with me, would you? Jesus, I turn from going my way to seeking your way. I ask you to forgive my sin, come into my life and save me. I want to know you. I want to learn to trust you. I know I can't do this by myself. Please help me. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, friends, that's it for this morning. Hey, Rose and I, <laughs> greetings to your house. The girls say hi. Yeah, everybody's home. Uh, Laurel is finishing up her quarantine. And uh, so pretty soon she can be a real human being again with us. Thanks again this morning to Tim Plett and DeBio and Pastor Mick and a host of others who have made this all happen. Keep following us, would you, at FGC Niagara on Facebook. Thanks again, Caitlin, for all your work. God bless you. Keep the faith. And I'll see you again next time.